And so about a year and a half later, I was in the Oakland County Jail up in the Ice House. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Oakland. Is that on the way to San Fran? Yeah, it's the other side of the bay. Yeah, I've been, I've done some runs up in that area from Arizona to San Fran, back down to LA, over to San Diego, Mexico, blah, 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 all around the back. Well, Oakland's not a place a white boy usually would, would go because yeah. uh, it's a hardcore ghetto and it's 85% black. Mm. And basically white prisoners have to be protected in the county jail there because, you know, they'll be in a, in a, in a cell with 25 ghetto blacks. Anyway, so because I was a CDC prisoner, uh, I was a state prisoner, I was put up in the top in death row with the, called the Ice House. And so they had this great big black, everybody's black in there, but this great big black sheriff deputy, he shouts out, yo, Ice House, Ice House coming. And they take you up to the very top of the uh, county jail there in the Ice House. And it's filled with everybody who's facing death row except a few state prisoners who were in there. And I was in there and I was sitting in my cell. Well, it was like a four man cell, but I was sitting there on my, on my bunk. And this young black guy comes in, he goes, yo, he says, you the white boy won that race in Vacaville. He says, I remembers now. He said, I should have known. I would have won all the brother's money. He said, only white boy that would run, I should have known. <laughs> 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 so, so it was and even in, in, in like the county jail, you can get an aerobic workout. So you can like, for example, run on the spot with your knees up about your chest and just keep that going for about half an hour. And it's you can have, heart rate up. You'll have a pool of sweat around and just the same as if you went for a real run. So it's possible. Did, what did you make bags out of to box punch? I didn't. I didn't do that. Uh, did it, they, did it like toilet rolls in socks in the Arizona jail? Well, in in San Quentin they had a they had a ring in the gym, and if you had a beef with somebody, and you guys mutually decided to work it out in the ring, they'd put you in the ring. But the trouble was for these guys was. Everybody's there watching. And these guys, most of them would just make fools of themselves because the guy get into the ring and they go hard and heavy at each other using all their anaerobic energy for the first round. Then the second round, about halfway through, they were gassed and they'd just be holding each other like a couple old drunks. And they were done. And basically they were revealing how unfit they were in front of everybody, which is not a good plan inside the prison. It's like a weakness display. Yes. So you're better off actually um, not doing that. I had a couple of Chicanos try to get me to go into boxing because they used to see that I could run. But of course, for the same reason, I don't want to go into, the, one, I don't want my, my face punched off, but uh, two, um, you know, you want to keep it hid. So. For people watching this, there was a few choice clips we took out of part one. I'll put them in the description box as well. They got quite a lot of views. One of them was, what happens when an Aryan brother asks you for your ice cream? <laughs> and the other one was, what happens to tough guys in prison? And the way John just tells those stories, like, like you've heard him so far today. It's just mind-blowing. Your, your method of delivery is uh, compulsively listenable to. So, well, here's a story about, do you remember a, a fellow named Philip Thompson? Philip Thompson, no. Yeah, he's the, he's the bad guy that everybody dumps on when, you know, in the stories that are around my name are basically because I was linked with him. Oh, the, the media articles about yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, he, he was at Vacaville. And he was no fighter, but he was a dangerous guy. And one of these um, AB guys decided to put it on him. And so Phil was, he, he was into all kinds of things. He was into machine guns. He was into 
making speed. He was into all kinds of stuff. And he was, he had that kind of reputation. But this guy in jail, there's a difference between a street reputation for being a tough guy and then being inside. And you can be number one mafia hitman, but you don't have any guns inside the prison. And that's not going to do you any good at all. So I heard a hitman say, I wish I had my <laughs> pistolas with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they say in America, they say uh, God made man and Sam Colt made him equal. <laughs> so. so how did this AB put it on this guy? Well, he put it on Phil. He just, he called him a punk and said, you got to get in the ring or, or you shouldn't be on the line and this and that. And Phil, being 225, 230, 6'5", he, you know, he was a big guy. But he didn't lift weights and he was kind of soft around the middle and, uh, you know, and he was also 35. He wasn't 23 or whatever these guys usually are. And so... He had to get up in the ring. But what he was is a dangerous guy, and, he, and he, he knew things. So when they came to the first bit of boxing, he just leaned into the guy, and he put his thumb into his eye and pushed down on his optic nerve, and, and the guy just went unconscious. Bam. Just put his thumb right in the eye and pushed down the optic nerve. Bam. The guy just fell out. And the guy didn't even know what happened to him. He, think, he thought he got hit. And so Phil just walked away and threw the gloves down. And he'd won the fight. So was there any blowback for that? Because did the other guy feel... Well, the guy, the guy didn't know what happened, you see. Like if you get choked out or you lose unconscious, you don't, you don't have no memory of what happened. So it was an example of what? People who know things sort of stepping out of the box. And of course that helped Phil's reputation because the fight was over before it started. So you gave three criteria earlier, so that would be like a fourth criteria then, wouldn't it? People who know things. People who know things. <laughs> well, see, Phil was, uh, actually, your, um, what's the name, Mr., what's the name of your, your friend there, the fellow from the States who reveals uh, fake uh, medals? Oh, let's keep his name out of it, please. Yeah, because, um, well, I was just, I'm curious about, because Phil, he used to talk about um, being, uh, have you ever heard of the Phoenix program in Vietnam? Yes, CIA. Well, it wasn't, the guys who were actually on the ground were in the military, mm. CIA organized, but do you, do you remember what they actually did? Yeah. I've read about it, but please tell the audience. So the, in Vietnam, the Americans and the South Vietnamese were losing the war because the Viet Cong would just infiltrate a village and then simply execute anybody who supported the government, school teacher, the village chief, uh, you know, the village tax officer, whoever it was. And this worked. They would just be found or not found, just disappear. And so they were, the Viet Cong were able to spread through all the villages because if you didn't follow the program, you disappeared or your throat was cut and you were thrown to the pigs. And so the Americans finally realized, hey, we should be doing this. And that's what the Phoenix program was. They tasked these guys, they give them a list of who the cadres were in each village and these guys would go in and cut their throats at night. And so Phil told me that's what he used to do in Vietnam. He worked for Uncle Sam doing that work. Now, you got to ask yourself the question, when you've had guys, young guys, doing work like that, night after night, month after month, and then the tour of duty ends, what kind of person, what kind of person, when they come back, what kind of person are they going to be? Well, look, right now you've got 20 plus committing suicide a day, and you've got shootouts and shooting sprees and a lot of them incarcerated. More than half of my friends in prison were uh, ex-military. So the adjustment is too extreme. And so people ask, 
how come Phil had, uh, you know, was able to maneuver around like he did? I don't, I don't have any access to U.S. military records, but it could be that, you know, having that kind of background opens doors that you and I would never see into. Mm. Do you think he enjoyed that line of work? I don't think it's a question of enjoying. I think you just get used to it. Mm. And people just get used to things. For example, in the Japanese army in World War II, they had a problem. They had all these nice mama's boys who'd been conscripted into the army. And how do you turn them into killers? How do you do that? And the Japanese thought, well, the best way is just get them into killing fast and hard. And so what they used to do is they bring Chinese prisoners of war and they give the guy a bayonet and then they say, just bayonet him. And the guy couldn't do it. And he'd say, no, you have to, or we're going to beat the shit out of you with rifle butts. So take, make your choice. And so you go over and poke the, poke the Chinese prisoner in the guts maybe, and then poke him a bit more. And finally he managed to kill him. And then he'd be vomiting, you know, on the side and maybe he couldn't eat for a while. And then tomorrow they'd have him with another Chinese prisoner. And eventually, you'd be surprised how flexible and adaptable humans are. After about four or five Chinese prisoners, he's just stabbing them right in the heart with wolfish smile on his face. And that's how the Nazis converted butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's... It's a it's a comment on the Nazis or the Japanese. I just think it's, it's in human. All, it's it's in all of us. If, yeah. if your group has decided to kill people, and you're in that group, then you have to do your duty. You have to, even though you might not like it. Have you ever read a book called Ordinary Men? No. This book, um, it's a real eye opener. It's um, it's about World War Two. Um, a unit of reserve policemen. They were kind of older guys in their 30s from Hamburg. And they'd been policemen, just beat cops. And they were drafted into the army into what was called Reserve Battalion 101 or something like that. And their job was to go into Poland and Ukraine and Russia and kill Jews. Now, these guys weren't Nazis. They weren't even members of the party. They were just guys from working class neighborhood. And this study, by the way, was done by the West German government to try and understand this. And these guys didn't want to kill people. And they didn't want to shoot children in the head or girls or mothers or grandmas. But that was the job. And so the officer in charge, he said, you know, I know this is difficult work, and I know a lot of you might not want to do it. He said, so if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. And then he also brought double rations of schnapps for everybody so they could drink to get them in the frame of mind for this work. Well, they spent three and a half years killing tens of thousands of people. And in the stories about these guys, guys were vomiting, guys were couldn't sleep at night, guys were breaking down, but they still got the job done. Now, this is the horrible part. Now, in civilian life, you'd say, well, they're all psychopaths, right? Well, sociopaths or something, they're evil. Well, the thing is, they're not evil, they're us. And if your group, whatever your group is, has the job to kill people, that's what you'll do. And it doesn't matter how the nice guy you think you are or don't think you are. If you're part of that group, you'll feel the need to be part of the group. And to be part of the group, you have to carry your weight. And if you're carrying, carrying the weight means shooting grandma in the head, that's what you end up doing. And the guys who were in this unit, after the war, they went back to their wives and their children and led normal lives, the ones who hadn't broken down or become total drunks. So what do we learn from that? This is stuff, I mean, people don't want to know about it because the whole thing with, for example, calling someone a psychopath, it, 
it puts distance between you who are normal, virtuous, good-hearted, warm, emotional person and this evil killer who could just, who has no empathy and kill people without without a qualm. It's sort of a a mental construct to allow you to put distance, say that you're a good person, but they're a bad person. I mean, in the old days, the priest would say, well, he has the devil in his heart. Or, you know, they would they would frame it in a Christian sense, because we were in a Christian society. Now we have psychology, a kind of a pseudoscience, which frames it in terms of, you know, all these different categories of what people are. But these people who were in this police unit, They started out as normal people. They did their wartime service and they went back to being normal people. And they weren't thrown in prison after that. They weren't brought to justice because of the realization in Germany, what, you're gonna throw everybody in jail who who shot a Jew? I mean, how many people is that gonna be? 